Hey, welcome everybody. Happy Friday. Um, as I say pretty much every week around this time, uh, the door into the Zoom webinar is apparently a single file door. Uh, and so people are streaming in at the moment. We'll give it a couple minutes. And also, as we all know, uh, we're not always all on time. So we'll, we'll start by about 3.32, 3.33 and get going. But for now, we'll, we'll let people populate the room. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. And, uh, and welcome back to the Smart Equitable Commonwealth, co-creating the society we want. Um, my name is Dan O'Brien. I'm the director of the Boston Area Research Initiative. Uh, this is, as you know, our annual conference. We're now in the 11th week, 12th week, if you count the fact that we took a week off last week. So uh, I hope everyone uh, had a good holiday weekend. Uh, I can imagine, especially after the last four months. Uh, I know I needed a breather. Uh, I feel like everyone did. So hopefully everyone got a little bit of a of a rejuvenating um, moment there and time away from email and Zoom meetings. Um, but, but welcome back. And today we are, are back in action with an exciting discussion about solving Boston's traffic crisis. Uh, exciting or traumatic, depending on your perspective, but um, it definitely uh, an important subject for Boston. Uh, before we go diving into the panel, um, I want to just give a few quick reminders. Um, the podcasts for our first 10 panels are now available through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Uh, these platforms are also where you'll find all future podcasts uh, released each Friday, so be sure to subscribe. Um, speaking of future podcasts and future panels, we are three weeks from the end. Um, we have three more weeks to go uh, after this one. Next week uh, will be about two Bostons and the idea of segregation and the different experiences that people of different races have in Boston, specifically the difference between uh, white Bostonians uh, and those people of color, especially the black population, uh, which I think will be a trenchant conversation uh, given um, the public narrative and public conversation that's been uh, occurring over the last um, month and change at this point. Um, and so really important. Following that on the 24th, we will have uh, a panel on pollution in communities and places and then we will wrap up on the 31st with a final panel on what cities and towns need now. Um, we will have uh, four mayors uh, and town managers speak, um, Mayor Walsh of Boston, Mayor Spicer of Framingham, Mayor Rivera of Lawrence, and town manager Bartha of, um, of Danvers. And we will have Mark Drayson, um, executive director of the MAPC, give a region-wide perspective, uh, and that will be moderated by Sid Espinoza, the Director of Philanthropy and Civic Engagement for Microsoft um, and a former mayor himself. Uh, so we're really looking forward to all of these three panels um, and, and closing out strong here. Uh, one last quick announcement. Uh, there will be no happy hour today. Uh, 
We're going to suspend the happy hour until the last week. We will have a final happy hour slash conference reception uh, after the panel on cities and towns. Um, but at the moment, we have found that while the happy hour served a, a great purpose, I think early in the conference of giving people the opportunity to um, connect and communicate after um, sessions, I think at this point, uh, the summer is more exciting and all those who are, are really uh, dedicated to learning from 3.30 to 4.30 probably have nice patios and, uh, and backyards or porches to sit on at 4.30. Um, so we're, we're suspending that for now. Um, so with all of that uh, uh, announcement behind us, traffic. Uh, and, and the theme for today. And it's funny, as I was thinking about my remarks uh, just leading into today's panel, it's sort of striking to think about traffic being that uh, I haven't been in traffic in a while. Uh, and, and I imagine many people on, on this webinar haven't, as, but then again, other people may have been in traffic because uh, for those who are not um, privileged enough to be able to work remotely, some are still driving right now. And, and there are reports out there that while transit ridership has plummeted in the last four months, um, actual personal car use has not dropped quite as much. Um, and could we be facing some challenges uh, as people, if people are still anxious about getting on trains, um, do we all wanna drive from now on uh, or for the foreseeable future? And so there's some really important questions here. So, so I think that rather than this being a moot issue at the moment or one that we table until, uh, you know, the pandemic has passed us, it could actually be a really critical one. So I'm really excited to have this panel today. I think it's going to be a really great conversation. Uh, it's going to be led by our moderator, Adam Vaccaro. He is the Globe's transportation reporter, uh, where he is absolutely an expert in the worsening traffic congestion um, in the region. He was the lead on the Globe's Seeing Red project last year, a spotlight team investigation into traffic, con traffic congestion and its causes in the region. But he's also... Um, an expert in all things transportation in the region um, with uh, lots of high quality reporting on bike share contracts, um, the MBTA and essentially everything else uh, that goes on locally in terms of um, transportation and transit. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam. Last announcement, um, Q&A is active as always. We are monitoring that um, in order to kind of guide a great conversation on the back end. We're also monitoring Twitter. If you wanna tweet at us at, at Bari Boston, or hashtag Bari2020 for the conference. Um, and with that, Adam, please take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Dan. Uh, thanks for having me and putting this panel together. I wanna say thanks to our uh, wonderful panelists and everybody who's attending and uh, Bari writ large uh, for putting this together. Um, yeah, as Dan said, I cover transportation for the globe and I, I kind of feel like every uh, globe transportation reporter is uh, to some extent sort of defined by the, the conditions on the ground uh, during their, their time. Uh, so we had a generation of reporters that, that uh, covered the big dig just seemingly around the clock, at least that's what it looks like when I look into the archives. And then, um, you know, my, my immediate predecessor, Nicole Dunka, she took over like two months, I think, before the MBTA ground to a halt in 2015. And so she was sort of um, all over the, the reform initiatives that began early in the Baker administration. Uh, and for me, I, I took over the beat in um, mid-2017, I guess. So the economy was hot and it would get hotter over the next couple of years. And uh, one thing that we were you know, already experiencing pretty well there, but would experience uh, uh, far more in the, the next couple of years uh, was the downside of that. One of the downsides of, of a roaring economy is uh, just epic traffic congestion that seemed to be getting worse by the day. And so I really considered that to be uh, absolutely the, the, the centerpiece of what being a transportation reporter was in this era for the globe, uh, that, that heavy focus on traffic. And so I say all of that only to say that I'm excited to host this panel and hear from uh, uh, folks who have put a lot of thought into this. Um, you know, it's as Dan mentioned, it's, it's a different condition out there right now with the virus, which has thrown a, a wrench at our transportation systems and, and uh, they might respond in, in any number of ways and we'll have to chart that going forward. But for today, we're gonna to get to hear about uh, ways that the, the uh, MBTA and, and bike share systems can, can help us uh, address some of the congestion issues that we've had in the past. And, and maybe we'll even look forward a little bit and see how they can play a role in addressing uh, coronavirus related transportation issues as well. We'll also hear about some public safety initiatives and, and what that tells us about, about behavior. So uh, 
I will stop talking now and turn it over to the people you're here to hear from. Uh, our first panelist is Connor Gately. He's with the uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Uh, and Connor is going to talk to us about uh, uh, the MAPC's bike uh, bike share system that it operated over the last couple of years on behalf of a number of cities and towns uh, in the, the metro area. Uh, just a quick introduction for Connor. He is a San senior land use and transportation sorry, a senior land use and transportation analyst at MAPC. Um, he arrived last September, uh, having earned a PhD at Boston University in Earth and Environmental Science. Um, and he has been doing a lot of research on climate change, urban climate plans, uh, sustainable energy policies, all things relevant uh, that, uh, to transportation, certainly, and, and uh, more broadly, uh, a lot of things that MAPC does. So uh, Connor, all you. Thanks so much, Adam. My screen shared. Okay. There we go. Okay. Thanks everyone for tuning in on a hot summer Friday. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about this project that I was part of, uh, sort of the first project as I joined MAPC back in September. Um, as Adam had said, this was. Um, Looking at the data from uh, the dockless bike share program, the Lime Bike uh, Bike and Scooter uh, dockless program that had been running uh, for about a year and a half over the um, 2018 through 2019. Um, sadly, I have to say that now at, at, at this point, the, the bike part of it um, appears to have been um, terminated. So um, some of the lessons we learned here will have to be reshaped for um, you know, future efforts to, to either replace or you know, pivot these kinds of micromobility options. Um, so getting right into it, really what we were interested in, um, we, we had access to um, this tremendously large data set that basically amounted to the GPS traces of all of these trips made by these dockless bikes. And we had this unprecedented opportunity to look at uh, where the trips were being made, when, um, what the origins were, what the destinations were, and uh, gain an insight into um, the real nitty gritty details of how people pick routes um, when they're using these micromobility solutions, uh, where they wanna go and how they wanna get there, and how that lines up with the um, existing transportation infrastructure. Um, are they riding where the bike amenities are good? Are they riding where the bike amenities are not so good? So, over the course of a couple of years, this program was rolled out um, starting at different times in different communities that you see here around the region. Um, started in Malden first. Um, and so here the towns are basically coded by the total number of trips over those 18 months, it's about 300,000 trips. Um, and so the most were in Malden where it started considerably earlier than everywhere else. Um, and you'll notice it, it doesn't actually include, you know, those four large uh, municipalities right in the center. Um, but as we looked at a lot of the data, there was still quite a, a bit of, um, of overlap across communities where you couldn't necessarily activate and use a line bike, but you certainly could ride one into that community and leave it there um, for, you know, for better or for worse. And so we had this really rich data set and we wanted to look at what are the things that people are interested in taking these, these vehicles um, you know, these trips on these vehicles to do. So almost half of the trips turned out to be starting and ending in what you would sort of characterize as main streets or town and city centers. Um, but a full quarter of them um, tended to end up in the sort of more distant neighborhoods surrounding these commercial um, districts. And so it seemed to be filling a need for people who were looking to make trips in and out of residential neighborhoods surrounding commercial districts where there wouldn't really be a transit option and maybe it would be a little too far to walk depending on you know, the time of day or the purpose of the trip. Um, and so in a sense, the most likely competition here would probably be something like an Uber um, for getting in and out of a residential neighborhood to restaurants or nightlife um, or schools or things like that. Um, and what was somewhat surprising, which we found was only about 15% of these trips started or ended at an MBTA uh, T station or commuter rail station. 
Um, so while certain aspects of the ridership seemed very focused on, on connecting to tea stations, in particular Alewife and the Minuteman uh, from Arlington saw a lot of trips. Um, broadly throughout the rest of the region, it seemed that people were mostly just taking these trips for um, some commuting, but a lot of um, other kinds of destinations, you know, recreation or retail or dining or things like this. So that was sort of the first take home message was that it appears that these sort of more free form micro mobility options were providing people with, you know, a way to do trips that they don't usually have um, an active transportation option for. So it was largely a, a giant big data crunching exercise. We had all of these anonymized GPS points. We didn't have any information on the people who were taking these trips, just the, the travel of the vehicles. And we, we ran this all through a routing engine and it's all based on open street map and the anonymized data is, is all available for download from our website. Um, but the key thing we were really curious about following up the sort of where are people going and you know where do they start and where do they end was, what does it look like on the roads and on the paths that they're taking? And so we did a classification of the different routes uh, throughout the region. And those of you familiar with um, Professor Peter Firth and his group at Northeastern may be aware of this concept called the level of traffic stress. Um, it basically is a way of classifying the sort of, you know, the, the sensation of riding on a road on a, on a bicycle from low to medium to high or very high stress, depending on aspects of the infrastructure, so that, such as whether or not there is you know, a dedicated facility for bikes or a protected facility, uh, the number of lanes, the speed of the traffic on that road. So while we weren't able to do sort of the gold standard level of traffic stress analysis, uh, because we were limiting ourselves to attributes available from the OpenStreetMap database, um, we were able to collect um, basically into three bins all of the roads. Um, what we call low stress facilities look something like these images you're seeing on your screen now. Um, you know, essentially comfortable for even the most novice rider, something you'd be happy to let your child ride their bike on. Um, these are typically dedicated facilities or protected facilities or very low speed low traffic residential streets. For the next category, sort of medium and high stress roads, these tend to have perhaps a bike lane without protection or you know, any sort of separation from traffic, but the streets maybe aren't as big, maybe a couple lanes at most, um, the speeds tend to be lower. And so these are sort of for your, maybe your middle of the road cyclist, relatively confident at riding, you know, alongside traffic or alongside parked cars, but not necessarily in the most high speed or busy roads. Those we reserve for what we call the high stress roads. So these are multi-lane high speed roads, roads with very limited or, or basically absent bicycle facilities. And so we looked at all the trips made by these um, line bike riders and it was rather surprising that when we broke out the shares um, by the miles traveled, as you can see on the bottom here, that you know, 18, almost a fifth of the trips, um, trip mileage was spent on these incredibly stressful roads, um, not particularly safe or appealing for, frankly, even a dedicated road warrior commuter bicyclist. Um, and there really isn't this expectation that the people who are taking these line bikes were that style of cyclist. Um, survey data provided to us from Lime Bike uh, suggested that something like half of the riders didn't own a bicycle, hadn't ridden a bicycle in the past month, and yet were willing through the desire to get to the destinations and the limitations of the infrastructure available to spend almost 20% of their trip mileage on these rather dangerous roads. And so this really highlighted to us a key take home here. And you'll see in this map, um, apologies to listeners to the podcast, you can go on the website and see all the interactive maps and data there at mapc.org. Um, but you'll see that the large red lines with the very thick hatching, as we zoom in here to Medford, basically highlight the, um, the high level of travel that people are willing to take on these um, very dangerous roads. And so this was a major take home that we thought underlaid what would serve as policy recommendations and things to think about looking forward. And this is particularly relevant, I think, in this COVID era, um, which is that there are people taking, you know, thousands of trips on roads that look like this, you know, roads that look like this, which frankly is terrifying, 
you know, places where even a confident bicyclist would feel on edge and a little nervous. And so these are the people who are already out there right now, you know, driving through traffic circles um, because they need to get somewhere and they want to get there on a bicycle. And this is the infrastructure that's available for them to travel on. So what we want to sort of take home here at the end, and I'll wrap up um, with this, is that these are the um, levels of travel from cyclists that we saw over the last year and a half. And in the conversations about whether or not we want to choose you know, roads that we want to improve and make them safer and more friendly to people who perhaps are unwilling or you know, not brave enough yet to take these new modes of transportation, and perhaps in the COVID era, even more um, motivated to do so now. Um, it's not just about building facilities that make it safer for them to travel on these roads. There are already people out there traveling on these roads that um, need the protection and need the investment in the infrastructure um, to make it safer for them. And then also to bring in hopefully new riders in an environment that allows them to travel safely um, and maintain a healthy um, level of social distancing on their commutes or taking their kids to school or all these very important trips as we attempt to you know, return to some sense of normalcy in the next year or two. So I'll leave it there and I'll, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, we can move on to the next panelist. Great, thank you, Connor. Uh, our next panelist is going to be Juliana Horiuchi. Uh, she is with the MBTA where she works as a policy assistant in the TE's Office of Performance Management and Innovation. Um, and they're kind of the, the, the number crunchers at the T who help um, uh, make sense of data and, and turn it into policy. At least that's always been my understanding um, from, from the outside. Um, she is a previous MBTA intern, uh, a Northeastern graduate, uh, where she has a degree in environmental science with a minor in food systems, uh, and uh, is very interested in public transit as it relates to sustainable mobility and social equity. Uh, Juliana grew up in Seattle and she rode the Metro bus to school every day, which she jokes uh, allowed her to take bus lanes for granted uh, as we still stare in wonder here in Boston. Uh, Juliana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. All right. Um, so as Adam said, I'm Juliana Horichi. I'm a policy assistant in the Office of Performance Management and Innovation or OPMI. Um, which is a shared service between the MBTA and MassDOT. And so I'm going to be talking about a project we worked on uh, last fall called Busable Streets. So buses have a really significant potential to help both alleviate bu vehicle traffic by getting people out of cars and onto buses and also promote equity in the urban environment, especially as a service that is both less expensive for transit riders as well as more flexible for transit agencies. Um, so this project was through the bus network redesign, which is a complete reimagining of the MBTA's bus network in order to reflect sort of the changing travel patterns that we've seen in the region lately. One thing that many of us may know is that the Boston area is not a grid system. And so that challenging geography and street geometries can make drawing bus routes and planning bus service really complicated. So what we kind of wanted to do with this project was ask what roads can actually get people to where they're going via bus. So Busable Streets was born out of that. And that's a GIS or a spatial shape file, which is assessing the ability of streets within the MBTA service area to accommodate a 40 foot bus. And it's intended as a base layer for the bus network redesign routing that's eventually gonna happen. Um, it has both fair weather and winter weather versions because there are differing priorities there. And it's also based primarily on public data. So the MassDOT 2018 road inventory is our main data source, um, plus some grade and bridge data added in. And it combines information on things like road surface type, percent grades for winter and bridge clearances into a single ranking system, which says this street is a busable street, this street a bus can travel on it if necessary, or this street bus travel is not recommended. And so besides integrating those supplemental data sources, one of the biggest challenges was a, with for us was making decisions in terms of what is actually busable, what does that mean to us? 
And so to make those possible decisions, we had to ask some questions. Um, for fair weather, those questions looked like what bridge clearances would be considered unbusable. And so for that, we looked at the inventory of our buses and the limitations of both the smallest and largest buses. So can this street accommodate some of our buses and not the biggest ones, or can it not accommodate any at all? Or bridge, sorry. And then we also wanted to incorporate street widths, but the data that we did have was sort of not quite reliable enough for us to confidently put in this. So we used a proxy of local roads, which is a functional classification, um, and that's pending some updates, hopefully waiting on a version two with some updated street widths to incorporate. And then in winter weather, the questions are slightly different. On top of those questions we asked, one of the big ones was what road grades are unbusable? So how steep does a road have to be before you don't wanna put a bus on it? Um, and so we asked a lot of service planners, um, where do you think that's an issue? And they would tell us either buses have trouble on this existing route in the ice, like it gets stuck here or there's always problems, or um, I would not put a bus on this particular hill. I don't think that's a good idea ever. Um, and then we also looked at snow routes, which is basically intentional rerouting because of winter weather in terms of putting an upper limit on, all right, buses cannot go on this grade usually. And so there are a lot of different sources for our decision-making. We definitely couldn't and shouldn't have done it alone. Um, and so it was really great to collaborate sort of across the agency to figure out how this could be most useful and how we could have the most confidence in it. And so use cases for this data set, we, help, we hope um, basically it will help to redraw existing and draw new bus routes for the bus network redesign as its primary purpose. Um, but there's also use cases such as supporting both planned and emergency diversion efforts for MBTA services. So if rapid transit stations are under construction and need a bus shuttle, making sure that the roads that the bus shuttle would go on can actually accommodate that bus. Um, and then future iterations of this may or will include hopefully measured street widths, like I mentioned before, um, information like parking, turn radii, floodplains, and street use and tunnel restrictions. And then also potentially a category for optimal bus busable streets. What are features that make a street even better for a bus to go on besides just being able to fit like transit priority and bus lanes and good sidewalks as well. But one of our big takeaways was that constructing a useful data set doesn't necessarily have to be really complicated. It can be relatively simple and it can also be accomplished with primarily public data. And so in terms of busable streets and COVID-19, we've all seen that buses have proven to be a really critical mode of transportation for both essential workers and others during this time. And so we are hopeful that this data set might be able to for one, provide context for municipal efforts to maybe close streets to pedestrians' bicycles and make sure that those are uh, kind of go hand in hand with our bus planning. Um, support the shuttle diversions that might happen from accelerated capital construction work that's happening in a lot of cities, as well as in general aid the bus network redesign and creating a bus network that's more adaptable to these kinds of changes and more flexible um, in the way that it's able to be executed. And if you want to learn more about OPMI, the Office of Performance and Management and Innovation, you can find our work online in terms of Tracker, the annual MassDOT report card, MBTA Back on Track, which is our performance dashboard, and also our open data portal. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Juliana. Uh, up next, we are going to hear from Yifan Liu. Uh, Yifan is with the uh, City of Boston, where she works in the city's uh, Office of New Urban Mechanics. Uh, she's a program director there. Um, she's uh, working across a variety of departments and community, sorry, she is working across a variety of departments and community organizations focused on transportation, economic development, and uh, food access. Um, she's going to talk to us today about a, a cool program where the city tries to uh, take advantage of one of Boston's um, uh, defining attributes, its, its competitiveness, uh, to uh, uh, mitigate one of its uh, less flattering 
uh, aspects, and I'll, I'll let her explain further. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to chat with you all and for um, giving me a reason to wear a shirt with buttons today. As Adam mentioned, my name is Zifan. I'm a program director at the City of Boston's Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. I'll be chatting with you about Boston's safest driver. In the spring of um, 2015, Mayor Walsh announced a commitment to eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries from our roadways through a Vision Zero initiative. And uh, you know, you've probably seen this policy uh, been adopted by many other cities at this point. And the policy promises action in four different areas. While a lot can be done through just street design, increased enforcement and traditional public information campaigns, much of the initiative success really relies on the ability of Bostonians to change the way that they behave when they are behind the wheel of a car. So we really do need to focus on the engagement piece and figure out how to um, just make Bostonians more aware of their own driving behaviors. But let's just take a step back and level set. You know, I, we, we as humans generally think that we are better than average drivers. Um, the stat on this slide, 93% of drivers surveyed rate themselves as above average. While this was from a study from a couple decades ago, I'm willing to bet some amount of money that if you redid the study today, um, you would see similar results. And in Boston, not only do we think that, um, we're not super nice about it either, um, coining the term mass hole, which you know, isn't great. And also we, as a city, happen to be really competitive as well. We really like to win. Um, while I myself am not a sports ball fan, I'm certain many of you are. Uh, we're a city of many championship sports teams, um, lots of scientists, lots of academics, so a bunch of just really, really smart and competitive people. So the question that we really that we're asking ourselves is, you know, how do we taking all of these factors, what can we do about driving behavior? Um, how can we ask people to prove that they are in fact a better driver than than average? So introducing Boston Safest Driver. In 2016, we partnered with a local uh, Cambridge startup called Cambridge Mobile Telematics um, to launch a competition that was the first of its kind at the time. And the app that Cambridge Mobile Telematics or CMT um, has developed is a telematics and behavioral analytics solution to measure driving performance and vehicle dynamics. And the app takes raw data from phone sensors to measure five different driving behaviors, speeding, rapid acceleration, harsh braking, sharp cornering, and phone use. And by using machine learning and statistics, the app is able to infer key metrics about one's driving behaviors and provide an aggregated score and personalized feedback. What's fun about it is um, when you download it and start driving, you'll be able to see how you rank against um, everybody else who's downloaded the app. So really driving that um, competition aspect of it. But before I get to the results of the 2016 and 2019 competition, you know, I really want to mention the privacy policy that, that we had in place for this particular initiative. I think in general, there's a, uh, there's a bit of fear around government and location data and things like that. Um, you know, to, but to provide drivers with feedback on the behaviors, unfortunately data must be collected, but to try to alleviate the fears that people have around that, um, we drafted a pretty robust privacy policy that explains in a really transparent way what was collected and what it could be used for during the competition. Uh, to be clear, no data corresponding to individual drivers was sent to the city of Boston. Uh, data was anonymized and aggregated and provided back to us um, in a summary report at the end of the competition. We just really wanna make it clear that the contest was largely about the user being able to reflect on their own driving behaviors. So to the actual results, um, and I'll go over both the 2016 and 2019 results because I think um, it's interesting kind of to kind of compare the two. Uh, on this particular slide is the, only the 2016 results. Um, and the first time we ran the competition among 25% of the drivers, the, the, the top 25% of the drivers using the app in the 2016 competition, we saw phone use drop, drop pretty significantly, 47%, and their speeding decreased by almost 35%. 
which is you know, pretty positive for what is effectively a public messaging campaign with just a little bit of a twist. We also received feedback that um, user re users really liked the competitive aspect of the competition, unsurprisingly. Um, you know, the, there's a quote on this page that says, uh, this app finally allows me to prove to my husband I'm a better driver, which is fun. So we ran the competition again last year, and this slide has a bunch of numbers on it, which um, you'll also be able to find on our website where there will be, uh, where you'll find a pretty robust report about the competition. Um, in the initial pilot, we, again, we saw the greatest growth from informal competitions among friends, families, and coworkers. So we wanted to build upon this. And in last year's competition, we partnered with the city's transportation management associations, um, three of the main ones in the city to incentivize adoption in both large and mid-sized employers. And the results are pretty interesting, especially if you take a look um, at both years concurrently. As you can see in 2016, we got around 5,000 downloads and in 2019, we have around 2,000. Even though we expanded the contest quite a bit in terms of outreach and prize money. In 2016, the prize pool was um, 10K and last year it was 25K. But what's interesting is um, when you take a look at the total number of miles recorded um, across the two competitions, uh, it's around, roughly the same, around 3 million miles recorded for both competitions. Um, and the total number of driving trips actually increased despite the lower number of users. Same with the non-driving trips and bike trips. So what that actually indicates to us is that um, those who actually did download the app used it more last year in comparison to 2016. And even though we did a considerable amount of outreach to partners, um, the corporate challenge actually didn't yield as many downloads as we had hoped but uh, did yield some really interesting feedback in that some of these larger companies didn't want to promote driving because um, they wanted to push forth some other commuter benefit um, programs, which uh, is not bad news to us. You know, it's great for our Go Boston goals. Um, and that's why they didn't want to push this type of driving competition. And in both years, the city learned a great deal from the competition, both about how an app can change driver behavior and about and about how Bostonians interact with the city's roads. As I mentioned earlier, while the goal is individual reflection, the app does collect location data, which was presented back to us in an aggregated anonymized fashion. And with this data, we can actually build a pretty good picture of um, problem areas in Boston and how we can leverage this information to better prioritize capital dollars to address some of these more dangerous segments. On this particular page um, is three flavors of data that we have to help us make better decisions. The one on the left is uh, the crash data map, which is also on our website. Um, and this map has uh, crash data from the past uh, five or more years, I think. And it has bike crashes, car crashes, um, and things like that. The middle map is uh, the data that we have from this competition. And the map on the right is human perception data from our safety concerns map, um, which was crowdsourced a few years back. So I'm gonna flip through the following maps pretty quickly. These are all from the 2019 competition. Again, this is all available on, in a report on our website as well. So you can look at it um, in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, I think we all know that speeding is pretty bad across the city. Um, you, the way to um, you look at this map is the numbers represent the crash the number of crashes that have happened in these areas and the red dots represent the fatalities that have occurred. Um, the blue is where there are lower instances of um, speeding and then you know, the more red it gets, the worse it is. So you can see that it's pretty bad along the, the downtown core area. Um, and then if you look you know, just outside of downtown core, there are also a number of other pretty dangerous segments that, that we've noted. Um, what's interesting about this data is that you know, we're fairly aware of all these issues that are happening across the city, but this is just one way to kind of like prove that, um, that there's just a lot of speeding going on. And it's similar with distraction, which you know, this map looks worse than the speeding one actually. Um, especially in the Back Bay, Fenway, downtown area. Um, and here are some other 
more specific segments and intersections that have been particularly dangerous. Um, sorry for the podcast listeners. You can uh, follow on our uh, in our report online. And harsh breaking is also terrible across the city as well. Um, and just to wrap briefly, you know, just thinking about the reality of life now, the last thing we need in hospitals is crash victims. There's already so much going on. Um, to Dan's point in the beginning, when he said, you know, he hasn't been in traffic in a while, it's actually, it's actually led to a lot of speeding incidents in the city, which is very concerning and higher incidence of crashes. Um, so it's fairly obvious that vehicles pose quite a danger to pedestrians, bikers, and the environment. So we really need to step up our game to try to reduce people's reliance on cars and provide more space for less dangerous modes of transportation. So um, I'm excited to see the work that um, my fellow panelists have been doing to um, advocate for things like that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Yifan. Um, we are going to go next to Philip Groth. Uh, he's a senior technical project manager at the T. Uh, we, have, we have two MBTA representatives here today. Uh, Philip works in the operations planning, scheduling and strategy department at the T, um, which is a mouthful, but he manages various data systems and internal applications with a focus on bus and rail ridership and performance. So it sounds like that mouthful is, is appropriate at least. Uh, Philip's gonna talk to us about one of my favorite topics, which is bus lanes. Thank you, Adam. Let me just switch over to this. Okay, thanks. So today I'm going to talk about measuring the benefits of bus lanes for the MB for MBTA riders and operations. So why bus lanes? Well, not that long ago, traffic congestion was one of the hot button issues, as we've talked about. And you know, here are some of the headlines that were referenced earlier, the introduction to this session. Um, uh, let's see. Buses you know, have long been caught in a negative feedback loop due to traffic. So more traffic makes buses slower and less predictable, which means more time is needed per trip. And then in, in exchange of the T can then run fewer trips with the same resources. Buses become even less competitive. And so more people switch to autos thus creating more traffic and exacerbating the cycle. So bus lanes offer us a way out of this and an opportunity to instead create a virtuous cycle. By dedicating a lane to bus and bike travel, bus trips become faster and more reliable. So the MBTA can then run more trips with the same resources and those trips are more predictable. You know, the, the thinking is that the buses then become more attractive to riders and ridership increases, justifying more investment in the bus system to further improve it. Moreover, uh, bus lanes represent a, uh, a more equitable distribution of street space by prioritizing the movement of people rather than of vehicles. So today I'll, I'll speak specifically to some tools that we use to estimate benefits of bus lanes for riders and operations in order to help communicate those benefits to local leaders and stakeholders. You know, I, I'm sure we can all imagine that dedicating valuable road space to buses can be politically charged. So um, when the benefits to any single bus is measured in seconds or minutes, it's important for us to show that a small savings for a single bus is much greater when put in the context of aggregate ridership and operations. So I'm gonna start with a few basics of the automated passenger counter or APC system, and then provide some examples of how that is used. And then I'll talk about next steps, particularly in the COVID-19 context. So automated passenger counters or APCs are dual infrared beams um, installed by each door that count riders as they board and light the bus. About 70% of MBTA's buses have these installed uh, with plans to bring the fleet up to 100%. And the picture on the lower right of this slide, um, my apologies to those on the podcast, is an example of one type of in our fleet. So for each stop, um, for each stop that a bus makes or doesn't make, the APC system will record the number of passengers boarding, alighting, and the net passenger load. But in addition to just measuring ridership, the system also records the time the doors open and close and when the bus moves from the stop. So this allows us to conduct a granular analysis of stop to stop running times. 
From these measurements, we can then calculate the dwell time or the time spent when the doors open, the time it takes to move from the stop and re-enter traffic, which I refer to as move time here, and the running time to the next stop. So when looking at running times, we're typically focused on two numbers. We're we really focused on the 50th or the median and the 90th percentile. The 50th percentile represents a normal day in average conditions, but the 90th percentile or a bad day is actually more important to us from a schedule planning perspective because we schedule to the 90th percentile. And what this means is that the cycle time of buses or the time it takes to complete a round trip, the run time plus the layover is set to the 90th percentile so that nine out of 10 times a bus should be able to start the next trip on time. Um, so even though these slow 90th percentile days should happen less often, reducing delays and variation at that 90th percentile is how we can really make transformative changes to the bus system. You know, this, this informs how we develop our schedules and maximize the use of our resources. So in the first step, we look at the uh, runtime in a corridor throughout the day, and then we break that runtime into individual components. Uh, ridership and our fare payment system affect dwell times while congestion affects the move time and the free running time. So when analyzing the impact of congestion, we typically put aside the dwell time and focus on the other components because um, bus lanes don't help how long it takes to put a $20 bill into a fare box reader and reload a Charlie cart. That's a, a separate problem. Um, so here I'm using uh, the Washington Street bus lane from Roslindale to Forest Hills as an example. Um, and this is from fall 2017, which was before the bus lane was installed. Now, this particular date range was, I'm being a little dramatic here because it was also affected by the KC overpass project. Um, so there's some con construction related uh, congestion built into these graphs. Um, but it is a good example of how running time evolves during the day, spiking during the peaks. Um, during the late evening and the early morning, midday and late evening, um, the run times on this one mile long corridor was about three minutes to, at median or four minutes at the 90th percentile. This is, this is, can be considered our baseline running time here, but during the AM peak running time increased to more like uh, seven minutes at the um, median and 15 minutes at the uh, 90th percentile. Uh, this increase in run time above the baseline is primarily caused by congestion from general traffic. So the intent of bus lanes is to create free flowing conditions for high capacity buses when they would otherwise be caught in traffic and then flatten those peaks uh, in running times. Now the bus lane on this corridor only operates between five and 9 a.m. which is why um, this part of the graph is shaded um, or highlighted. But you know, although an all day bus lane would certainly provide more benefits, uh, in this case, a morning only bus lane addresses what is the biggest time of delay. So if we look one year later after implementation of the uh, bus lane between 5 and 9 a.m., this is what the runtime profile looked like. Um, as you can see, that a.m. peak is no longer there, and um, running times during the a.m. peak are at or below nearly every single time of the day. So that delta between what we saw before and what we're seeing now is you know, how we think of the benefits of, of um, this bus lane. So the next step is to look at ridership. I'm gonna to switch to a different corridor here, in this case, Broadway and Somerville, where a dedicated bus lane in each direction was open in fall 2019. Now, my goal in sharing this example is to show you how runtime savings are translated into passenger time savings. Now, the ridership in this corridor is much lower. It's about 30% uh, about of the Washington Street example, uh, but this bus lane operates all day in both directions. So it's kind of a, it's a first for the region, and um, outside the silver line. And so it's a, it's a, it's a pretty nice example. Um, we use the APC data in this case to calculate the total number of riders on the bus by half hour time period first. And then, and so you can see um, as depicted in the figure here, now I use winter 20, um, this is winter 2020, which is most recent. Here I used a winter based comparison because the bus lane was put into effect in the fall and it was kind of tinkered with halfway through. So I, I kind of had to switch to a different season there. Um, 
but the, uh, you know, you see the blue line represents the inbound peak and ridership. Um, and this is per half hour. And then the other line, which peaks in the AM heading to Sullivan. And then in the PM, it peaks in the outbound direction heading away from Sullivan. Although there are bi-directional peaks at both during both uh, rush hours. So here, then we look at the, the difference in corridor running time before and after bus lane implementation um, during the corresponding time. So in this case, bus lanes are saving up to three minutes depending on the time of day. Um, again, the median is used to represent the change that riders experience on normal day and the 90th percentile represents a bad day. The largest runtime savings from the bus lanes are at the 90th percentile where, you know, as expected, it has the strongest impact on scheduled cycle time and reliability. So then we multiply the time savings by the ridership for each hour of the day and use that to estimate the total savings over the course of the day. So in this case, the bus lanes are saving riders 55 to 75 hours per day of excess travel time. Um, and better yet, as a result of this bus lane and in conjunction with investments in better frequency, ridership was actually up 30% year over year in this corridor. And that was, that was just prior to COVID-19. So obviously, that's changed things. And so um, where does that leave us now in the COVID, post-COVID context? Um, so ridership is down, um, as we said, but it fell less on the bus than on any other mode in the system. Um, and right now ridership's roughly about 40% of what we, it was a year ago. Um, but our crowding standards are much more restrictive. So our current policy has reduced the capacity to bu per bus at about 40% of what it was before to reduce health risks to our riders. Now, at first travel times fell so much due to the reduced traffic that we were able to run buses more reliably, but that is rapidly changing as more people return to work. And, you know, as the globe has started discussing. Um, now, if traffic returns to the same pre-COVID levels or it gets worse due to more op riders opting to switch to private cars, we'll be caught in the same cycle again. So the T is working with municipalities to speed up bus lane construction um, and to help us maximize the use of our available capacity. Now this changing environment certainly complicates the before and after comparison, but we're continuing to work with our partners and stakeholders to identify opportunities to create more bus priority measures and evaluate the efficacy of these measures. So looking forward, uh, my, my colleagues at OPMI and, uh, and their team are working on a dashboard to sort of automate and standardize the reporting of these metrics so that we can report to leadership, partners, and our customers more regularly. So for more information on some of the bus line projects, there's a, there is a bus priority, bus transit priority page at mbta.com. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Philip. Um, okay, so we are going to go into a Q&A session here for, um, Seems like we might be able to get 15 or 20 minutes out of this. Uh, I want to address what we've all addressed uh, <laughs> a few times over now, it feels like, and, and many of our uh, panelists got at it in, in, in their discussions, but um, we're in a different world right now uh, with COVID-19 than we were when you all were preparing uh, uh, this research. Um, and there's one element in particular that I, I think, um, geez, uh, Connor, Philip, and Juliana, you could all chime in on this. Um, but this is, this is about the dedication of space uh, for other modes of transportation, for pedestrians, frankly, for, for restaurants um, is another thing we're seeing right now. Uh, on the one hand, it feels like there's an argument for, for sort of taking a defensive approach, do this while nobody's looking. Um, and that way we can, you know, if that way we can dedicate road space uh, ahead of the return of traffic to uh, allow for more efficient um, modes of transportation to, to get around uh, and, and perhaps uh, head off some of that return of traffic. On the other, and I, I wanna give credit to one of our audience members who, who wrote in about this, maybe now, uh, maybe now isn't the right time to do this because there isn't traffic uh, and, and the need for bus lanes in particular, Philip, you were talking about that, that feedback loop is less, uh, less acute. Um, I don't know, the, the, those feel like two sides of, of a debate and I'd be curious to hear uh, all of your takes on it. I can jump in first. Um, 
one thing that I touched on it briefly, but in terms of the busable streets map and figuring out where buses can actually go, I think part of that too is figuring out that if space is dedicated to other places um, on roadways, that it should go hand in hand with transit use and not fight it. Um, so if you have a street that is closed off to pedestrians and bikes only and buses aren't allowed, but it's the only busable street in the area, then you might have a bit of an issue in terms of sharing space versus if there are more alternatives for buses in the area, um, there might be fewer implications in there. Um, I, I'll just note that a lot of our bus lanes are actually bike bus lanes um, and, you know, give out, make space for both. And, you know, some, not everyone likes it, but actually like if, if you're on a corridor where a bus is stopping frequently, the, the overall average speed of a bus and a bike are about the same. Um, and so it, they can complement each other nicely. And I also think they work together to reserve the space better. Um, especially where we don't yet have the frequency that we might want, um, having bikes helping reserve that space <laughs> is, uh, I think, is a helpful use. A um, little harder on the uh, restaurant side. <laughs> I'm not going to ask any of you to, to weigh in on that uh, too hard, although I will note that a couple of you expressed interest in, in food. So, um, okay, cool. Connor, do you want to chime in there or... or um... If not, no pressure. No, I might as well keep keep it moving for the time for all the questions we can get in. Great. Then, then I do have a question for you, Connor. Um, you know, it, it was interesting to hear you talk about um, the ways that the data points from the line bikes allow you to sort of realize where infrastructure changes are are possibly necessary, um, or at least would be beneficial to. Uh, uh, making cyclists who are already there safer and possibly attracting more of them. Uh, and I don't want to get too far away from the concept of bikes, but it, it also just made me think about what kind of data, um, what, what we can do with data from other people. So there's a lot of talk about, about Uber and Lyft, uh, especially out of, out of your neck of the woods of MAPC and how we could benefit from more data from them. And I'm wondering if there's similar sort of practical things that, that MAPC thinks uh, getting that kind of information would do, similar to thinking about where better bike infrastructure could be. What, what could we learn from that data and how could it inform policy decisions? Well, I think for me, one thing that stood out um, is how sort of exceptional it was to get access to that kind of data. Um, you know, there was a lot of work that went on in the in the years preceding this, both locally to set up this program and a lot of negotiations, but on the uh, what's called MDS, the Mobility Data Standard, um, which I think is also somewhat infamously being uh, it's the subject of the lawsuit between Uber and the city of Los Angeles, I believe. Um, you know, these companies don't particularly want to share this data, um, they're probably happy to monetize it. Um, certainly, you know, they're pro they have access to the data that, you know, we negotiated access to. And so they, they can, you know, use it for their various, uh, you know, research or, or other purposes. But in the city of Boston, you know, there's one permanent bike counter in Kendall, I think. Um, and so absent this, and particularly sort of sadly now that the line bike program, they've stopped focus, they don't wanna do bikes anymore, they wanna focus on scooters. Um, we don't really have a good sense of where people are riding. Um, you know, with blue bikes, you can get, where do they get it, where do they leave it, but it doesn't give you this critical piece of information on where are they going along the way. Um, and I think that's really key for building, you know, a groundswell of support in the neighborhood, locally, um, amongst business owners and, and the public that, there are riders here and that they are, you know, their customers too, they're taking their kids to school and building that kind of local support for these infrastructure improvements is really vital. So that, I think that's a big take home about how we figure out how to support those kinds of initiatives with data going forward. Oh, sorry, you muted. I can't believe I'm four months into my endless Zoom and, and still do that sometimes. Um, Connor, just, just keeping it on you for, for another moment, we did get a question from the audience uh, from, from Paul Schimek. Uh, Paul, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, he wanted to know uh, how much of the, the travel on high stress, high stress streets that, that you noted for line bikes, um, 
were you able to determine whether or not that was on the sidewalk or the roadway? And then, then I'll, I'll add to that question and just ask um, whether or not, you know, the availability of a sidewalk sort of should factor into our thinking here, whether or not that, that makes a difference. Yeah, you know, we, we tried because there were obviously routes that we looked at, you know, we Google street viewed them and we were like, wow, that's pretty crazy. There are people riding on that road. And in some cases, it, you know, I think, and I, I returned in the chat to Paul there that I think it's Revere Beach Boulevard. You know, there's like a 16 foot wide sidewalk and in the Google street view, there's someone on a line bike and they're on the sidewalk um, and they're not on the shoulder list high speed parkway. So we didn't have the GPS precision to basically tease that out in all cases, but there were lots of sort of, you know, anecdotal observations that we had, you know, that we looked at that it's more likely they were on a sidewalk than not. Um, and then in other cases, there's obviously no alternative facility, you know, like that rotary I showed in the talk. So um, it would be tricky, I think, with just the data we had, um, but reviewing the hotspots and kind of the critical areas where it seems clear that there's a, there's a choke point or something like that through bad infrastructure, um, I think it's easy to determine the, the key places where you'd, you'd want to consider at the very least some sort of you know, shared space off the, off the main road to serve both bike and pedestrian you know, desire lines. Okay, great, thanks, Connor. Uh, Yifan, a, a question for you. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to make a distinction here, but I, I'm curious if you've given any thought to whether people are more motivated to drive safely from the aspect of competition, or if if just the fact that somebody is is they know somebody is watching that alone that alone plays a role. You're right in that I I don't think I can make a distinction, but I can speak from personal experience in that, um, and maybe you know fellow panelists might agree with me. If I am being watched, I will do things more safely, definitely. Cool, and I think we all know that safety and and uh, traffic congestion are. are you know, closely related in, in some ways, um, just on the basic uh, idea that if you have a crash, that's gonna cause backups. But I am wondering if you've given any thought to, to um, whether that same concept can be applied to almost think about ways to just get people to think about whether they're driving too much to, to uh, have an effect on volume uh, in, in some way or another. That's a good point, you know, and that that kind of reminds me of the um, feedback that we got from a lot of the corporates where they're just like, we just don't want to be pushing um, driving competitions because we don't want people to drive. So one thought that I had um, that if we were to do this competition again, it would be more about commuting in general versus just around driving to try to push people to other modes of transportation. Great. Uh, Philip, we, we have a question that um, I actually think has some, some pretty big COVID relevance. Um, it's from an audience member, Maynard Clark. Uh, the automatic passenger counters, are they located at both doors? Um, what if the driver brings somebody into the back without collecting the fare, for example, is the way he phrased it? Or what if somebody uh, oh, yeah. gets in or uh, go, goes in the front, gets out the back? Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, that's that's They're, obviously um... relevant right now because uh, not only are you having people board through the back, but you're also you're also trying to judge crowding uh, in a way that that uh, is really unique to the COVID era. Yes, the um, they measure ons and offs at both locations. They're actually dual beams in a horizontal configuration, so it can tell which direction you trip the beams, um, whether you're entering or exiting. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, right now, it's actually our only source of ridership information because uh, we aren't people aren't paying at the fare box. So um, without these, we would have no way of measuring who's on buses. Or uh, sorry, how many people are on buses? They can't measure who. <laughs> and and Juliana, um, you know, the, the your topic was so almost fundamental in a way that's that's. Uh, funny because I, I never would think about it, but but literally, what streets can buses go on? Um, are you how how will that factor into the the redesign effort? In, you know, writ large. I mean, will that will that shut off concepts that that maybe would have would have seemed appealing, or do you think that you know there's enough 
uh, uh, streetscape nearby those streets that can't fit, that, that uh, buses can at least get pretty close to, to where they need to be? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, definitely, I would say um, the majority of our bus routes right now go on streets that are indeed busable. So if someone is attached to their bus route, it's probably not going to be changed because of the street itself, though it might. Um, the bus network redesign, too, is um, kind of focusing on um, those finding high priority corridors and um, like looking at travel demand and where riders are actually going, where they're taking transit or not. And so this is intended kind of as a base layer, but ultimately planners like Philip are the ones that actually know how buses do on the streets. So it's intended to be sort of a, an initial check, but I don't think it's like an overruling factor for sure. Um, well, I, I don't have any more questions on, on, on my list and, and I believe we have a, a couple more from the audience. So I'll just, I'll just go through those real quick and then, and then, um, we're getting close to 440. So, uh, maybe we'll close up shop after that. Um, let's see. You know, a couple of you work for the state, so, uh, I don't know if you'll want to answer this, but I, I, we do have a question from an attendee um, who did not share a name, but they, they were asking how we can make progress uh, in, in fighting congestion, but also I would imagine on their mind is climate change. Uh, as long as we continue to sort of prepare and design for uh, the level of vehicle traffic we have now or, or a level of vehicle traffic that, that goes beyond that. Um, what, what are our, our I guess to, to broaden that question, what are our options beyond um, beyond simply providing mode options or, or are there any other options? And that is, that is open to the entire panel. All right, I'll... I'll... I'll step in front of the in front of the firing squad. Um, there, are, I mean, there are there are tons of options, and there are options that are palatable, and there are options that you know would would never survive the political process. And there's options we should be pushing the political process towards. Um, you know, like a lot of things, travel behavior, it's highly complicated and, and, it, and it's difficult to know whether or not you'll have unintended consequences in certain locations, but the fundamentals of how people respond to uh, travel time and congestion and, you know, the supply of options for them um, is pretty well established in the literature. Um, you build more roads and people fill them up with cars, you know, so induced demand has you know has been a thing for a while that everyone I think all the traffic engineers accept, um, and so in some regards that you know the opposite is the case, um, and it's basically never really palatable in a lot of cases to you know you you see how we struggle even to remove a lane of parking or a lane of, of street travel to replace it with a bus lane, um, but as Phil showed you know not only did the travel times for the buses improve the ridership went up. And the travel time for the for the cars improved as well. Um, and in a dense city like Boston, you know the the supply is the is the space we have, and the supply you know will be met by the demands depending on how we decide to allocate those those resources. And I think we have to start you know with what do we feel the space is worth using for. Yeah, I'll. Um... I just looked at some of the other comments that have come from the audience. Um, you know, I, I agree with everything Connor just said. And, uh, you know, one of the things right now for this rapid response on bike lanes is while traffic's down now, <laughs> let's build what we can. You know, maybe some of it's temporary, maybe some of it can become permanent. But, you know, there was some debate over the uh, bus lanes for the, um, for the Green Line shuttle from Leachmere to North Station and pre-COVID there was debate. Uh, when traffic collapsed, we were able to put them in without, with 
very little, very little pushback. Um, and time will tell how that, you know, how that works as traffic returns, but by claiming that space while there's no traffic on the road makes it a whole lot easier <laughs> moving forward, at least in the interim. Yeah, those uh, those shuttles by Lechmere, by the way, they're I've I haven't seen them, but I've heard that they're leaving like every two two to three minutes. Is is that right? That's um, I I don't want to sidetrack us, but that 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 is a way of uh, hopefully just giving some some level of social distance on those things. I'd hope. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean that's the intent, and certainly we're achieving far better frequency at far less cost than would ever be possible. Um, without the bus lanes, so. Mm. Okay, uh, fantastic. Well, I think that uh, we are basically in good shape to, to call this a day, but I wanna thank all of you for participating and uh, everybody who's viewing for, for doing so. Um, I, think, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll do that. Um, it's been it's been great to hear from all of you and think about the ways that we can uh, utilize these streets going forward, uh, whether it's congestion or COVID or or where the two meet. Um, I am going to uh, I, I actually am a little embarrassed right now because I don't know how we close this. I don't know if I'm <laughs> supposed to. I, oh, oh no! I've, you. Here's Dan. I, I've turned myself back on. No, yeah. you you you've done great. Thank you, Adam. Um, right. Thank you, Dan. So yeah, thank you to the panel. Thank you, Adam, for for leading us through here and for for your expert. Um, questioning and, and interrogation. I, I love to end on a, on a controversial and, you know, forcing us to think about big things note. So that was a wonderful way to close out. Uh, thank you to the panelists, Philip, Yifan, um, Juliana, Connor, it, for sharing your expertise, your work today, and for, for engaging in the further conversation. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from you and your colleagues in, in the coming year. And, you know, next year's conference, maybe we'll be in person. And um, we'll, we'll have the next stage of this conversation. Um, so with that, thank you to all the participants as well for joining us today. Uh, this doesn't work without you guys. Um, everyone have a great weekend and we look forward to seeing you next week uh, for a conversation about two Bostons. Take care. Thanks everyone.